All right, let's go ahead and get started this evening. Let's grab those hymn books as we all stand together. Turn to hymn number 164, hymn 164. Praise him, praise him, hymn 164. We'll sing all three verses there on hymn 164 together now on that first verse. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. On that second verse, praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrow. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. On that last verse now, praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed redeemer. Heavenly portals loud with Hosanna ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Good singing this evening. Go ahead and turn toward the back of the book there. Hymn 246, Redeemed, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. Hymn 246. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse there on hymn 246 together. <clears throat> Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. On that second verse, the redeemed and so happy in Jesus no language my rapture can tell I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb redeemed redeemed his child and forever on that last verse now I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight who lovingly guideth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night redeemed 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 by the blood of the lamb redeemed redeemed his child and forever I am. Thank you so much. And you can be seated. I hope you've had a great day. And uh, looking forward to the meeting tonight, what God has for us. And uh, I'm down a few men tonight. And uh, Brother Aaron and, and his wife have brought forth a wonderful baby into this world. And uh, we're rejoicing with them and uh, grateful for that. And uh, they just got home a little bit uh, this evening. Uh, a little while ago, and so we're praying for them and uh, looking forward to uh, God's blessing on their family, and I'm sure you've seen uh, the pictures there on Facebook, and uh, that's great. We're excited for them. And of course, uh, Zach and Sarah are moving today. Uh, all the rest of their belongings closed in the house tomorrow, so let's make sure we pray uh, for them uh, tomorrow that all goes well, and, and uh, that's great. 
through the weekend. Let's be faithful all the way through. And, of course, uh, Saturday, our soul winning at 10 o'clock. Let's be faithful. Now, if uh, you've been interested in the bus ministry and uh, have volunteered to help us, or if you didn't volunteer for the bus ministry uh, but would like to help us on Saturday, uh, we'll begin building the route. And so that simply means just beating some shoe leather on pavement and uh, finding some boys and girls who like to come to church. And I can promise you it won't be hard to find a few, and uh, those few will become many. Uh, it, I'm just telling you, that's just how it works. And uh, so we'll work hard at that beginning that Saturday, and uh, then, of course, the next Saturday after that, and starting September 7th on Thursday night. And so we're looking forward to that. So if you'd like to be a part of that ministry, uh, that'd be a wonderful blessing. And uh, there's nothing in the world like giving your time to seeing people come to know Christ as their Savior. Boy, is this nothing like it. Uh, I'll tell you about the revival before I preach tonight. But uh, they, brought, they brought me a boy uh, after chapel I preached today, 11 years old. And boy, he had tears streaming down his face. And uh, he said, Brother Cox, he says, I need to get saved. And uh, so we sat down there in the church and showed him what the Bible said and prayed and trusted Christ. I said, you still look bothered. Oh, he said, I am. I said, what's your question? He said, can I ever lose this? And uh, so I went back in the Bible and I showed him that uh, uh, all that the Father hath given me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And uh, I answered that question. Then he said, well, I got one more question. I said, sure. He said, but what about my mom and dad? And uh, then it gets serious, doesn't it? And uh, I said, you know, I believe that God might be using you as a very instrument to see your mom and dad get saved. And uh, I'm praying for that boy tonight. His name is Joey. If you can write his name down, pray for him and his mom and dad. He said, I don't know what to tell them. And uh, they had all different types of tracks in the back of the church. And... Um, and so I, I, I gave him a few of those things. I said, read through these and pray and ask God to help you. And the fact is, I didn't know what I'm sending him into, uh, but God knows. And uh, you pray for that little boy. But, boy, there's just nothing like giving our time to seeing people get We had a boy get saved in the school here on Monday. And uh, he's been here, and, man, he's just been so excited about the Bible. Um, and that's great. And uh, we've just been excited to see their interest in spiritual things. Well, at the end of last week, uh, I guess Thursday afternoon, uh, they were talking uh, at recess or I don't know what class it was. And uh, he said, I need to get saved. I want to get saved. And he said, where's Brother Cox? Where's Preacher? Where's Pastor? And they said, well, he's gone or he's not here. And, uh, well, I want him. I want to talk to him. And so uh, <laughs> I preached up there Monday, came back, and it was Phoebe's birthday. And, and I got here before school was out. And so uh, I said, Luke, I said, I heard you wanted to talk to me. Yes, sir. So we came down here in the front row. And uh, I said, they told me that you want to get saved. And he said, yes, sir. He said, I sure do. I said, what does that mean to be saved? He said, well, it means to confess to Jesus Christ that we're a sinner in need of salvation. And uh, he had, boy, he had it all figured out from the Bible. I said, well, do you know how to pray? He said, well, I think I can get one out. And uh, you don't need my help. No, sir, I don't need your help. So he bowed his head. He said, Jesus, save me. <laughs> How about that? And uh, uh, seventh or eighth grade, and just calling out to the name of the Lord. And uh, boy, that's just, that's why we're here. And that's what it's all about. And uh, so this bus ministry, I mean, it's just going to be exciting to see what God does over there. And if we'll work hard at it, we'll not only see God do some work over there, then we'll see God do some work in here as well. And uh, you know, if you won't be selective about the kind of fish you catch, God will send to us the people that he wants to be in our church. I believe that. And uh, so don't sample the soil, just spread the seed. Amen. And uh, let God use you to win souls for Christ. Any number of anybody in here can be involved in that. All of us can be involved in that. And uh, let's, work, let's work really hard at it. So sat, uh, soul winning Saturday morning. And fellas, I got a text from Brother Chris today. said, Preacher, I don't have a bow tie. And I said, well, we'll, 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 get, we'll take care of that, Brother Chris. And he's got a massive tie collection, but not a bow tie. Uh, and so we'll have a good time with that, fellas, on Sunday. And looking forward to that. We'll get a group picture at the end of church on Sunday. And uh, we always enjoy I think the ladies mentioned doing something in their hair or on their shoes. I don't know what they're going to do. But, uh, you just uh, partake if you'd like to. My wife's looking at me like, what is this man talking about? And... Uh, <laughs> 
I was over in Ocala with a bunch of rednecks all week. I got some weird ideas. I got to be purged, uh, jump in the ocean, get get uh, get back to normal. But anyway, we're glad glad that you're here tonight, and uh, looking forward to what God has for us. I see some old friends with me tonight. Good to see good to see them. James is back there. Good to see you, my friend. And the brother Brian is here. Good to see Brian as well. And uh, we're glad that you're here. Many folks probably tuning in with us here on YouTube, and uh, we're grateful that you're here to be with us here tonight. Let's stand together, may we? Brother Jeremy uh, will come and uh, lead us. Do we have a chorus? All right, windows of heaven are open. Brother Jeremy will come and lead it, and uh, then we'll greet one another tonight. Brother Jeremy. If you need the words, it's on 203. The windows of heaven are open there on that chorus. You ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Go ahead and greet those around you at this time. Sing it one more time together. He gave me a robe of pure white. You can be seated as you make your way back to your seat. Please be seated together. One more time. Sing it with me together. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. Let me hear it. Joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. Wonderful. Fellas, come, will you please? And uh, we'll make ready for uh, the offering tonight. Let's be faithful in our giving, as God has been so faithful to us. And uh, let's pray together, and may we? And... Uh, the Rogers family going to help us here tonight. Uh, Michelle was trying to give me the plan. She kept throwing all these M names at me. I just gave up. I said, just do what you're going to do, all right? And uh, wonderful. We appreciate it uh, so very much. 
And uh, orchestra practice starts Sunday. How about that? And that's exciting. Boy, that's just awesome. We're going to have to expand this platform. And uh, my mother-in-law, she just, man, she just, why are you going to expand the platform? Just bust the walls out. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay, Mom, go ahead. And uh, so she'll bring the wrecking ball. And, uh, but we are going to have to bust those walls out. Amen. My mother-in-law has been at the hospital all day. And uh, she was helping the errands, the Burgess. And uh, she got headed back to Edgewater, and she thought, you know what, I could go home and rest or go here. My favorite preacher in the world. And since Larry wouldn't have church tonight, she came up here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I tell Larry that uh, she's, he's her favorite just because, you know, it's not... It's just not worth it at Thanksgiving dinner. It's just not worth it. But everybody really knows who the favorite is. Amen. And uh, that's good. I was talking to Brother Hobbs real quick. Sorry, guys. I was talking to Brother Hobbs, and uh, he said, when are you having a missions conference? I said, well, I already got my speaker. I already got it lined out. He said, well, why don't we team up on this thing? And he said, uh, uh, maybe we can share missionaries. And, and I thought that was a good idea. Well, I didn't know. I have, I've got a great preacher coming, but I didn't know he was going to schedule Joe Arthur to come. And preach. So we're going to switch speakers, and and man, it's it, I'm excited. We're going to have a great time. End of February, and uh, pray for Brother Hobbs. And uh, I tried to get him to come down here and preach for us, but uh, he was too busy fishing. <laughs> and uh, we'll get him down here sometime. And uh, when the internet's broken, we don't want people to know who we have preach here. We'll have we'll have Brother Hobbs come. So. That's good. Let's pray together, may we? And uh, Brother Willis, lead us in prayer, will you please? In the name of the Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. We pray for each one. We thank you, Lord, for the children and the church and the church. We pray for Brother Hobbs and his family and Brother Hobbs and his family. We thank you, Lord.
Amen. Brother Dave and I were uh, in Ocala several days this week at the Central Baptist Church, and uh, we were where that piano used to be. And uh, Brother Dave played on a digital kawaii, but I tell you what, we drive in the Cadillac over here, my friend. And uh, amen. Praise the Lord. These ladies are going to sing for us, and uh, before I come, from the book of 2 Samuel, 8th chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and uh, looking forward to what the Lord has for us uh, in the music as it prepares our heart for the preaching of His Word. So have your Bible ready, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and first these ladies are going to sing for us. I appreciate so many of you praying for us this week, and uh, we were part of a Christian school revival, and uh, they began uh, with us on Sunday night. I appreciate the guys filling in for us uh, on the, the Lord's Day evening. But we began on Sunday night, of course, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I thought we were going through Wednesday, and uh, on Monday I found out we were ending on Thursday, and uh, I only have four sermons, so man, I was really stretched by the end of the week. Uh, and, uh, man, i got to tell you, we started out on Monday, and I really don't know, Brother Tony, if it could have started any worse. I get in here, and I think, you know, I'm going to use music to break the ice with these kids. And so on this side, about 250 kids, uh, I've got 6th, 7th, 8th grade. And descending from the back here to the front, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade here. So I've got 6th grade girls here and seniors, boys and girls, sitting right here. And uh, they sang a little song, and, and uh, it just didn't get them jazzed up too much. So I thought, I'm going to get them going here. And so I thought, well, I'll just choose something I, they know because it's, uh, they have an open enrollment. So any number of kids are there. And I found out later there uh, were Catholic young people. There were a few Muslim kids in the school, which I was a little surprised about. So I divided sections up. I said, this section here will sing hallelujah, 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 and this, this side would respond. So, so we did. And man, this side was just, they were just absolutely engaged. And then I came to this side, and they looked at me like I was an idiot. Now, that might be true, but don't look at me that way. I mean, it was bad. <laughs> So I, I thought they were all deaf. I, well, let's try it again. Well, the same thing, two or three times. So I thought, man, I'm up against it now. Uh, and uh, just tried to preach, and man, I left. And you know, if you've ever tried to present the Word of God, you'll know what I'm talking about. It was just like I was just pushing against a brick wall that was just totally immovable. And uh, I, was, I was just vexed the whole way home on Monday. I thought, dear Lord, you're going to have to help me here. And I'm going to try something different. 
And, uh, you know, the, the Lord taught me something, and maybe it'll help you. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, judge nothing before the time. Uh, you know, at first we don't meet with success. It's our temptation to say, well, I'll just, I'll just mark time, do the best I can. And the Lord really smote my heart and said, you know, you're here. You're here to break through the wall. You're here to be a blessing. And so, on my way in to, um, Tuesday, I said, you know what? If they won't participate, I'll, I'll buy them off. So I stopped at McDonald's and got me some gift cards, praise the Lord. And I said, how many of you like McDonald's? I held up those gift cards. I said, now I need some help. Boy, I think every hand in the building went up when I did that. And uh, God began to work. The power of the Word of God. Then the Lord said to me a second thing. You know what? You're not trusting the power of my Word enough this week. And then I went back Wednesday and preached. And just the Word of God, you can tell, started working in the hearts of, of young people. And so I was praying all last night. Preached in church last night. And... Uh, Got to finish up this morning. And uh, Lord, give me something. Got to draw the net. And uh, this morning we preached and gave the invitation. Three young people walked the aisle, trusted Christ as their Savior. And about 30 or 40 young people. Uh, boy, I, and you could see it. Just pulling away from that pressure, their friends came down and uh, walked to the front. Uh, to surrender their lives to the Lord. And uh, that was so great. That was so great. And uh, just praying for those young people. I'm just praying for that boy I, I dealt with after, after church this morning. That the Lord will bless him. And all of them, really. That God, God will touch them. And I know many of you are praying with me and for me. And I appreciate that so very, very much. I want you to take your Bible with me, please, to the book of Second Samuel in chapter 8. 2 Samuel chapter 8, this is my sixth time preaching since, uh, since Sunday night, and so if I put uh, Moses on the ark and the well in Jonah's belly, just get on with it, all right, we'll be all right, I've, I've, done, I've done that before, uh, amen. 2 Samuel chapter 8. I felt like if I laid a dud, it'd just give Larry an advantage with his mother. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 8 and verse, verse 1. And after this it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took uh, Methagama out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured he to put to death and with one full line to keep alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David smote also Hadad-Ezer, uh, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and uh, twenty thousand footmen. And David uh, huffed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for an hundred chariots. And when the Syrians of the Damascus came to Sikor, Hated Ezer, the king of Zobah, David slew of the Assyrians two and twenty thousand men. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. Notice very carefully. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hated Ezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Batah and from Barathai, cities of Hated Ezer, King David took exceeding much brass. Verse 14, he put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, put he garrisons, and all they of Edom became David's servants, and the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. As I was looking through this passage of scripture, of course, most of you know that we're going chapter by chapter through the life of David, and let's be honest, uh, it's easier preaching in 1 Samuel 17 than it might be here tonight. How do we apply this chapter to our lives? Now, last week we were in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. And of course we understand that David has come to the throne. The united tribes of Israel lay at his feet. His house has been built in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, the city of Jerusalem has been taken by, from the Jebusites and all is coming up smelling roses for David. And then in chapter 7... 
course, David begins to have a desire in his heart. He looks at his beautiful house and he says, I want God to have a permanent house because we've brought the ark up into our city. We want God to have a permanent place in our city. And he has a desire to build a house for God. And as you remember, uh, God, through the prophet Nathan, said to David, I appreciate your sincerity, I appreciate your heart, but that's not the task I have for your life. But I will use your son, and your son will be my son. And while you're long gone, God said, I, I'll nurture him, I'll help him, I'll reprove him, and I'll be with him. And of course, we know David rejoiced at that thought, that he had put something into motion and his eyes would not see that thing. His eyes would not see that temple. But yet he was as much part of that temple as his son was because the vision, the burden, was born in his heart. Now if God said to you, you're not going to be able to fulfill this desire, what would you do? If you had a burden, something to do for God, and God would not allow you to do that thing, how would you respond to that? Well, it would probably na be natural for us to, to mope or to pout concerning God's decision, but David did not do that. We find here in our chapter, rather than, rather than being discouraged, David began investing in what God was going to do through his son. Often in our lives, we, we search for our place in God's program. I mean, one of the basic questions of existence is, how did I get here? What am I supposed to do while I'm here, and where am I going when I leave this place? We all think that. And that what we're supposed to do in the here and now occupies our time. Maybe in the disruptions of our lives, have we ever dealt with those? When we're blindsided. I was driving the other day. I couldn't help but think of this. I was driving the other day, and a fella came up to a stop sign, and I really don't think he egregiously came too quickly upon it, but, but I, I swerved outside of that lane, and I remembered when I did that why I seemed to always do that. I did that because several years ago we were T-boned, and our car flipped, and every time somebody comes on me like that, it's just kind of natural to dodge the collision. Sometimes in life we've been T-boned by trials in our lives and things that it came out of nowhere. That, that wreck, somebody said, why didn't you avoid it? Because I didn't see it coming. And I don't think if I'd have seen it coming, I, I could have prevented it anyway. And there are things like that in our lives, aren't there? And we search for our place in God's program. What does God have for me? David says, I want to build a house for you, God. And God says, I'm not letting you do that thing. But David said, if God won't let me do that thing, then I will separate myself to help someone else do that thing. And that someone else was his son. See, David's hands would not build that house, but the hands that did build the house used that which David invested in the house of God. He found his place in God's program. I want you to understand before I continue that the will of God is something that every Christian can and should know. Let me say it again. The will of God is something every Christian should and can know. You can know the will of God for your life. I made a bit of an adjustment as I was preaching to the kids today. It was an adjustment based on something I heard when I was a kid. I went to Christian school, I began hearing them say things like this, will you surrender to full-time Christian service? And that's not a bad thing. We started training in Bible college and training to serve the Lord, and I think we extrapolated full-time Christian service to full-time Christian pay. And I said to them today, how many of you will surrender your lives to full-time being a full-time Christian. That's how I said it. You see, you may never draw a check from a church, but you ought to always be a full-time Christian. Amen. Amen. To find your place in God's program, you can know and should know why God placed you here. David here in our 8th chapter, he separates himself to the will of God for his life. There's a great verse I 
I want you to look at it. Go to the Proverbs with me, please. Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 1. Proverbs 18, verse number 1. I ask you this question, what has God put in your heart to do? What has God put in your heart to do? I don't think a man ought to give himself but to anything outside of what God has put in his heart to do. Oh, I want God to fill my heart. I want God to fill your heart. Why am I making a big deal about bus ministry? Why do you announce that all the time? Because I'm praying it'll get in your heart. Because when it gets in your heart, it'll get in your habits. It will get in your thought process. Uh, it'll get into your time and your treasure. It'll occupy all of your talent when God gets down in your heart. Amen. When you have a burden to do something for God. David's son is writing these words, Proverbs 18, verse 1, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. It all begins with a desire. When a man has a desire to do something in his heart, in his life for God, first of all, he separates himself to that desire. He separates himself. In other words, there are things maybe not bad things in his life, but there are unnecessary things in his life that would keep him from fulfilling that desire. Pretty obvious. I don't have less than 10% uh, body fat. That's pretty obvious. But if I were a trained athlete, every, every bite of food that went into my body, Brother Jeremy, sometimes I just, I just hate Brother Jeremy. I, I hate to admit that, but I do. That man eats like a stinking horse. And look at him. I looked at Marie's lasagna the other night and gained five pounds overnight. But if you're going to be a great athlete, there's just some things you have to separate yourself from and some things you have to separate yourself unto. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, then he does a second thing, he seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Maybe he makes friends of those that can help him become greater in that desire. What is in your heart to do for God? Well, to have a growing desire, not only for God, but for the work of God. Why did He place me here, and what does He want me to do? I'm simply saying this. In our chapter tonight, we find David finding his place in God's program. Not a sourpuss Christian, disappointed in what God would not let him do, but satisfied that God would use his son, and finding a way to be involved in the work of God. Now let's go to our text, please. 2 Samuel chapter number 8. And I want you to see three ways in which God provided for David. Number one, I see David uh, had God's provision of safety given to him. The Bible opens up in chapter 8, verse 1. After this celebratory praise fest that David has with God, the end of chapter 7, it came to pass... David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took uh, Methagamah out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab and he smote Edom and on and on we could go. We see God's hand of protection and safety upon David. Now notice the enemy we find here in verse number 2, and he smote Moab. Now what we've been trying to do uh, as we go through the life of David is take the Psalms that correspond to those Bible stories, work them in. And it's been a while since we've been able to do that. Uh, the reason for that is pretty interesting. David wrote most of his Psalms in 1 Samuel when he was on, on the road, on the run from Saul. It's interesting how trouble uh, sponsors so many great thoughts about God, isn't it? He hasn't written for a while, but now he does. And uh, hold your place here. Go to the 60th Psalm, if you will, please. Psalm 60. David is writing this psalm in accordance with the events that takes place here in 2 Samuel chapter 8. And he makes some pretty strong statements about the enemies of God. And he says here in verse 7, Psalm 60 verse 7, Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab, notice it carefully, Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Now he mentions Moab here as being a wash pot. That's obviously not a compliment, is it? 
Now, Moab, we know, was the child born of Lot's incestuous relationship when he had left the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with his daughters in tow. Moab was a region of the country on the east side of the Dead Sea, extending as far north uh, as the river Arnon. And the words expressed here, Moab is my washpot, mean exactly that, the most base of vessels in a house, a, thing that, uh, a vessel that things are washed in. It implies here that Moab was not regarded as adding anything to David's strength or to the value of his dominion, but that compared with other portions of David's kingdom, it was of as little value as a wash basin in the house. Then he mentions Edom, and notice again verse number 8, Edom will I cast out uh, my shoe. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. Now here, uh, David was anxious to possess this land. If you've ever seen pictures of Petra on the internet or in picture form, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, that would be the capital city of Edom, a very hard city to penetrate. David says, I'm going to overtake them, uh, and even against them will I cast out the shoe. Now, that was an interesting allusion there. It's the expression, uh, when transferring a possession, you would throw down a shoe on the ground as a symbol of occupancy. David th says, I'm going to throw down my shoe and take that place for Almighty God. Then he mentions an interesting little expression in verse 7, where he says, Judah is my lawgiver. Now, it's very interesting David uses that expression because it points back to the prophecy of Jacob in Genesis chapter 49 where the Bible says, "...the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh come." It was a foreshadowing or a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ to come. And what we see here is David as a man of war, he is taking names and taking care of business and God is protecting him. And as we know, to the victor go the spoils. So secondly, in our text, we see God not only providing David's safety, but we see God providing David's substance. Now let's look in our text, 2 Samuel 8, and notice what it says in verse number 7. Now watch your Bible. And David took the shields of gold. Verse 8, King David took exceeding much brass. Verse 11, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and the gold that he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued. Verse 12, of Syria and of Moab, of the children of Ammon, of the Philistines and of Amalek and of the spoil of hated Ezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. Here we see God not only providing David with safety, but spoils with substance. We read of shields of gold and exceeding much brass in verse 10 of vessels of silver and vessels of gold and vessels of brass. Now what is David going to do with all of those blessings? Now what did he pray for in chapter 7? He prayed to build a house for God. God said, I'm not going to let you build that house. And David said, well, you know what? If God won't let me build the house, I'm going to stockpile some building materials when my son gets to do it for God. The Bible says, notice what your Bible says. We read it a moment ago in verse 11, which also King David did dedicate unto the Lord with the silver and gold that he had, he had dedicated of all nations which he subdued. He said, God... You've given me these spoils of victory, spoils of war. And God, I dedicate those to you. And when you are ready to build that house in our city, he said, God, I take my hands off of that and I give it unto thee. You might find in your Bible, I want you to notice the words in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, if you have it there. 1 Chronicles 29, and I want you to read the heart of David on paper. You see, when God really gets a man, you know what God gets? God gets everything the man has. And what's interesting about David and Solomon, his son, is that David had things, but things didn't have him. But Solomon had things, and as we very well know, everything Solomon had owned him, didn't he? And Solomon lives an empty, vain life, having everything but under the sun without the Son of God. Notice what David said, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1. Furthermore, David, the king, said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. 
Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. The gold for things to be made of gold. And the silver for things of silver. And the brass for things of brass. The iron for things of iron. And wood for things of wood. Onyx stones and stones to be set. Glistering stones and of divers colors and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Moreover, because, notice, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of silver and gold, which I've given to the house of my God over and above all that I've prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold, the gold of Ophir, the 7,000 talents of refined silver, to overlay the walls of the houses withal, the gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artisophers. Notice carefully. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? David said, I want to tell you something. I prepared some things with all my might for the house of God. I love that. I love that. David realized that he didn't live to himself and he didn't die to himself. David understood that the things of this world can be dedicated to the things of God, that he might give us all for the cause of Jesus Christ. We see David's response to blessings. I wonder tonight as we think about our blessings, if our blessings have taken our minds and hearts away from God. Or we've seen God as the giver of those things and seen our responsibility to give back what God has blessed us with. You know, it's pretty interesting, isn't it, that God's eternal work is financed by temporal things? That's interesting, isn't it? You know, we ought to understand this, that what we're doing is eternal. We ought to think about that. When you're in a week like, like I've been and just prayerful and serious-minded about it. You're reminded again that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We're in a spiritual battle, aren't we? And it's an eternal battle. The, the, the consequences are eternal. There's, there's a line drawn through the ages, and, and heaven and hell turn on that line. It's a serious thing, isn't it? It's a very serious thing. We turn from the seriousness of it because we don't like to live in the reality of just how consequential our life is. I mean, it'd be easier for us, would it not, to live our lives unto ourselves, living for temporary things, not having our minds on eternity. But if we set our mind to eternal things, we understand how eternal God's work is. And God says, there's a way that I want to finance my eternal work. And by the way, God has never been late paying His bills. Oh, Hudson Taylor went to China in the 1800s and he said this, God's work done in God's way will never lack God's supply. Boy, that's so true. God takes care of his bills. We get in on what God is doing. We understand that our, our, our temporary life can be used to make a difference in eternity. And by the way, you know what God said? God said all the gold, he said this through Haggai the prophet, all the gold and all the silver, it belongs to me. I've kind of traced that gold and silver through the Bible. David begins collecting all of that gold, all of those precious things that go into the building of his son's temple, what we call Solomon's temple. Now we talked about that last week, that house being worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Then of course we know the Babylonians came. You know what they did? They destroyed the temple and they melted that house and they took the gold and the silver and the brass and all that precious metal into Babylon and they occupied all of that possession for a while. And then what happened? Well, the Medo-Persian Empire took over the Babylonians. Guess what they got? They got all the gold and the silver and the brass and the precious jewels until finally the Medo-Persian Empire fell and the Greek Empire took over. Guess what they got? They got all the gold and the silver and the precious stones until guess what happened? They fell and the Roman Empire came to power. Guess what they got? They got all the gold and the silver and the precious stones. And God said to Haggai, don't worry about, don't worry about how small that second temple is because... All that gold and all that silver belongs to me. And when Herod the Great came to power before the days of Christ, 
He sent back word to Rome and he said, I need a way that I can ingratiate myself to the Jewish people and I'd kind of like a way to make myself look good. And he sent back to the Roman Empire. He said, by the way, can I have some gold and silver and precious stones? And he took them and he adorned that second temple in Jerusalem. And when Jesus walked into that temple adorned with that gold, maybe on his lips were these words, all the gold and all the silver belongs to me. In other words, it might be in pagan hands today, but inevitably it belongs to God. Amen. Well, to understand that, what was Powerball? $650 billion paper dollars. Amen? Paper dollars. Boy, I want to live my life for something that endures. The fire of the judgment seat of Christ. David said, he won't let me build it. I'll finance the work. And then, notice number three, we see David's resources and his response. But notice th thirdly, we see David's reputation. Now notice what your Bible says here. The Bible says that David got a name. He got a name. Look, if you will, verse 13, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting, of the, of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt. Now, when I first read that, I'm trying to figure out how great that name was. Now, my idea is, man, he got a great name. But you know, God already gave him a great name. Look at chapter 7, verse 9. The Bible says, and I was with thee. God said, I was with thee, whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name. But it says here in chapter 8, verse 13, and David got him a name. Well, he didn't say a great name, did he? Now, what name did he get here in chapter 8? What name did he get? The Bible says, if you look at it, in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 8, For said Hushai, Thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds, as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. Notice carefully, 2 Samuel 17, 8, And thy father is a man of war, and will not lodge with the people. Now what we find is, won't take time to look into all these verses, but 1 Chronicles chapter 28 the reason that God would not allow David to build his house, you know why? God said because he's a man of war. David got him a name. You know what it was? He's a bloody man. He's a warring man. He's a fighting man. I often get a kick out of our perceptions of little King David plucking on his precious little harp writing his dainty little songs. Are you kidding me? He's a warrior. He might pluck a harp with blood-stained fingernails. You understand the, the image? Don't we sanitize and demasculate, uh, demasculize? I, I'm not going to try to say that word a third time. It just didn't come out right the first two times, and I'm just going to move on. Amen. We do that to Jesus too, don't we? A little effeminate, Anglo-Saxon man. I remember as a kid being in a Bible bookstore, and, and please don't be offended at this, but there was an African heritage Bible. Moses and Abraham, Jesus and his disciples were all black. And I thought, as a kid, that's ridiculous. They weren't black and they weren't white. Jesus was a Jew, amen. Amen. And sometimes we, we depend on... The, I remember we have a boy in our school and he was arguing about long hair. Didn't want to get a haircut. Because Jesus had long hair. And Ethan said he did not have long hair. He did so have long hair. He did not have long hair. Why do you think he had long hair? Well, he's like that in the pictures. That's what the little boy said. He's like that in the pictures. You know what? I'm glad we don't know what Jesus looks like. You know why? Because we know him best when we read about him in his word. But David got him a name. 
He's a bloody man. He's a man of war. Think about this. How could a man of war build in the city of Jerusalem called the city of peace, a house for God in which men could make peace with God? Oh, Alexander McLaren said, The temple of God, of the God of peace, cannot be built except by men of peace. That is true in the widest and highest application. Jesus builds the true temple. Controversy and strife will not. And on a lower level, the prohibition is forever valid. Men do not atone for a doubtful past by building churches or founding colleges, endowing religious or charitable institutions. David, a bloody man, will not build a house that's known as a place of making peace with God. He got a name. And finally, very quickly, God not only gave him safety and substance, but God, God gave him servants. What's, what's very interesting is that Saul served for many years, but Saul did not have a government hierarchy serving under him. And we see, we see God doing that. Verse 15, And David reigned over all Israel, and David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. And Joab the son of Zeruel was over the host, and Jehoshaphat the son of uh, Ehilad was recorder, and Zadok the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech the son of Abiathar were the priest. And Sariah was the scribe, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was over both the Cherethites and the Pelethites, and David's sons were chief rulers. Not bad reading for a fellow from Tennessee, amen. What's God doing for David? More than just Joab, his general on the battlefield, but Benaiah that was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. We see Zadok and Ahimelech, uh, the priest of God, taking care of religious matters. And then he has civil officers. One, that was his personal secretary to put the king in mind of business in its season. Matthew Henry said this man would been, have been the prime minister of the state, yet not entrusted with the custody of the king's conscience. And then... He would have another man who served as a scribe or secretary of state. And then at the conclusion here we see David's sons who will grow up to be fit for royal business, made chief rulers, having places of honor and trust assigned them in the household and in the camp. I'm simply saying this. Can we not see that David said, you know, if God won't allow me to build his house in Jerusalem. I will build, best I can, the resources necessary for my son to do what God wants him to do. He found his place in God's program. That's what he did. It's time for all of us to think earnestly about our place in the program of God. I just had lunch today with the principal of the school Graduated from the University of Florida, uh, had several degrees in uh, agriculture. He traveled the world for the U.S. government in teaching the laws of agriculture all around the world. Obviously making an extremely handsome salary. He's great at math and science. His wife was on staff at the school and on a Friday afternoon he said the preacher was never around. He walked into my wife's classroom and said, called the man's name. Who's teaching science on Monday? He said, my flight to leave for Japan was heading out on that following Monday. Who's teaching science next Monday? School is starting for the year. I don't know. And he said, I really didn't take him seriously. But I, got, I began to think about it, he said. He said, God just pretty much put it on my heart. You're the guy he's looking for. He said, I called Washington. He said, I had three years left for full government retirement. I called him up and said, I'm not going to Japan. Oh, he said, they were furious. Taking a cut in pay, but not a cut in professions, my friend. He showed up on Monday morning. Now with over 450 students at his charge, affecting lives for eternity. You know what he found? He found his place in God's program. You say, well, he, he may miss out on a lot of that money. Well, you should have seen the gleam in his eyes when he talked about his kids. 
you should have heard the stories he told about how God had prepared him through all of that employment to do that great task. Don't we look at things backwards sometimes? We see things in life as a means to an end, but they're not means to an end. The end is our meeting with Jesus Christ, finding our place in His program. And God help us to be like David and say, if I can't do that, maybe I'll help somebody get a job done. Man, we're talking about that bus ride. I've got to be honest with you. I, I would admit that riding that bus in that neighborhood, that may not be for everybody, but you could help that person getting on that bus. You say, oh, I couldn't teach. Well, you might help somebody teach a class. Well, I could never preach. You know what a preacher depends on? He appreciates people praying for him as he goes to preach the Word of God. Finding our place in God's program. Let's bow our heads and pray, may we? Father, thank you for this evening tonight. I pray your word has helped us. Lord, as I think about our lives and I think about the things that all of us are facing, Lord, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, not to have our affection on things below. Where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But help us, Lord, to set our affection on things above, to find our place in your program, to get busy doing what you've called us to do. Lord, help us to be the Christian you've saved us to be. In Christ's name we pray. I, I, I just want to bear down on something here, and I'll close in a moment. In our time, in the use of our time, are we giving and finding our place in God's program? In the use of our time. In the use of our talents, are we finding our place in God's program with our talents? Our natural abilities, our spiritual gifts, our supernatural abilities, are we using our gifts for the glory of God? What about our treasure? We'd be denying the scripture tonight not to suggest that the thing David did most in the matter of finding his place in God's program was providing treasure to finance what God was trying to do. As God works, speaks to our hearts. Where we're seated tonight, Brother Dave, plays a verse there for us. I wonder if we might say, Lord, I want to know what I can do in your program. And I want you to give me faith, to put feet on my faith, and to step out and to do what you've called me to do. Brother Dave, play it for me there, if you will, please. Finding our place in God's program. In our whole being, in our spirit, our soul, our bodies, would we give all of ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ to be used for his glory. May God help us. There's needs that abound in our communities, in our lives. There are little boys with tears in their eyes that will ask us to pray for their mother and dad to come to faith in Christ. May God help us. There's missionaries waiting, waiting to get to their field of service. Father, we know that you love us and care for us, and we thank you for that. But we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Help us, Lord, as Christians. Maybe we're hurting tonight, dealing with trials in our lives. But, Lord, help us to find our place to serve you faithfully. And we'll thank you and praise you for we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand together, may we? And uh, glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, let's have a great, let's have a great, I always call it the weekend. We all know Sunday's the first day of the week, but we call it the weekend. Let's just have a great couple of days and allow the Lord to use us. Come on Saturday if you can, and uh, we'll look forward to that together.
Let's sing a chorus as we make our way out. Let's go back to our chorus we sang tonight. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. 206. 203. Brother Jeremy says 203. Going once, going twice. The windows of heaven are open tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. God bless you. Speak to someone, say hello, and it'll be a blessing as you're on your way out. Good to see you tonight. God bless you.